Good afternoon. Um, as was said, I, I'm Mike Hitz. Um, this this uh, discussion is going to be over the es expansion of the use of our salometers in our ASOS network. Currently, they're mostly used for um, detecting cloud bases, and um, this this this, I mean, this study that was done is going to um, give motivation and reasons to use it more um, as a LIDAR than just for cloud bases. Okay, so why are we doing this study? Um, the primary reason is the NRC study that was done back in 2009, which I'm sure most are familiar with. Um, basically, this study concluded that the uh, nation, the U.S. network, was uh, had a very, very good synaptic scale, um, you know, observation, um, you know, uh, resources. But on the meso scale, the resources were, were lacking. Um, they they pointed out several areas that the U.S. needed to improve on to uh, better um, observe the atmosphere on, on this scale. I mean, here's a quote from the paper. It's, it's the U.S. has a slotted, solid synaptic scale, but its mesoscale observational capabilities are highly variable in quantity, quality, accessibility, and um, instrumentation. All right, and, and with that being said, uh, we, we feel that ASOS network which I'll show a map of um, in, in the coming slides, uh, could definitely strengthen and um, in, in, in support in that area. All right, um, so this report identified several national needs uh, that, that it felt the U.S. could improve on. Um, and, and I pulled three, three out in particular um, that we, we feel that ASOS network um, could support. And, 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 and they are tracking um, atmospheric plumes, um, tracking the dispersion of smoke and fire, um, and, and also providing high resolution weather information for, for now casting and um, things of that nature. Okay, so, so here's a, a map of the um, many ASOS stations that we have across the country. It's a tri agency uh, venture. Um, so if any changes are to take place, it's, it's going to have to be agreed upon um, through, with the agencies. Um, so, so you can imagine with this dense network, if you're able to have a uh, profile, backscatter profile taken, that could assist many different areas, such as dispersion modeling, um, again, tracking pollution, um, and, and many other like areas. Okay, so credit given to Balademos of, 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 I guess, UNBC now, was Howard University, um, probably about three years ago. He discussed with um, the, the, the then ASOS manager of the underuse of the salometer. He, he made the point of many areas that the salometer, you know, could assist in. Um, and from that, from that discussion, we had a uh, meeting um, at, at the Sterling Field Support Center not the WFO, but the Sterling Field Support Center. Um, and, and we kind of point out different areas that the salometer could support in, which are before you in blue. Um, it could, could support the NRC recommendations. So one, one critical area is to, to monitor planetary measurable, measurable heights at all those different locations. Um, again, track air pollution, uh, track cloud bases, which it currently does, and now casting. Okay, and from this meeting, the National Weather Service, um, um, in particular OSNT, awarded a grant to the NOAA Center of Atmospheric Science, NCAS, to conduct a proof of concept um, evaluation of the salometers. Okay, and, and this, this, this work, which, is, which will be discussed now, um, is, is carried out under the pre preview of the National Weather Service Sterling Field Support Center and the uh, Office of Science and Technology. All right. Uh, Okay, and it's done in a three three phase approach. Um, the first first phase is basically to build a local network. The second phase is to expand the network to more climate regimes to again show the robustness of the salometers and that they can act, you know adequately perform under these different regimes. Um, and and then then to sit down and talk with ASOS management about implementing the use of the of, of this these results um, and enhancing the use of the salometers throughout the network. How that should take place. Okay, and I, I'm going to say that, and this this uh, PowerPoint, this discussion, gonna mostly just be over the, the first phase. 
All right, um, so the methodology taken for the first phase was first to develop a, a local CL31, which is the, the Visla, you know, CL31 model. Um, that's the Salama that's currently used in the ASOPS network, so to develop a local network of these systems. Um, uh, the, the second phase, well, I, I want to mention too, um, of this local network, Unfortunately, we were not able to utilize the current ASOS stations, salometers. Um, ASOS management, management um, at the time thought it was too much of a risk um, to tap into those systems, to use it for more than just measuring cloud bases. You know. So they wanted us to prove that we can do this with standalone systems. So that's what we have um, for the D.C., Maryland area. We have a, 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 you know, a local network of standalone systems. And I'll show a map of that um, coming slides. Okay, but the second part of this methodology is to develop a uh, central repository, um, and, and then we're going to, you know, accumulate the data and assess it for those different components. So here's the map of the local network. So Sterling is out here to your to your left. We have we put a salama out there. Um, along with a uh, Marco Pulse higher power LiDAR system. So, and, and again, the, the red ones, they're, they're the primary systems in our network. Um, over here is where we have a uh, salometer at the uh, NOAA uh, Center for Weather and Climate Prediction building, on top of the building. Um, that's in collaboration with the Air um, Research Laboratory, ARL. Um, and then out here at Billsfield is where we have another salometer. Um, and out there, there's many other higher part um, LIDARs, inc including the latest salometer by Weisler, the CL51, and the CT12, and the older edition, CT12Ks, and we have CT12Ks here at Sterling, too. Um, and, we have a, and we have this uh, supplemental um, LIDAR systems that, that we, we haven't used as of yet, but we may use um, in the coming analysis of the project at these different locations. All right, so here, here are pictures of the three primary locations. Uh, this is at Billsville. We have it basically sitting outside of, of one of their buildings. Um, this is a, a sort, of, sort of aerial view of the, the salometer test bed that we have at Sterling. And we have a couple CL31s sitting in that test bed that we're going to use for the test. Um, and uh, at the, the uh, College Park area, the NCWCP, we have the salometer sitting on top of the building. Okay, so here's some information about our data repository. Um, I, I'll just skip down to the part that I haven't touched on. The radio sign data is going to be used to evaluate the uh, PBR height detection, um, LIDAR detection methods that we're going to apply to the data. We're using radio sign data from the WFO Sterling um, site when we have 852 signs for, the, for this year, 2013 to 2014, that we're going to use for the analysis. Uh, for the Sterling site, the non-operational data we're going to use, uh, and that's going to be about 33 signs, and then we're going to use the radio signs from the Billsfield site, and that's about 48 signs. All right, so we'll we get now to the results, some um, quick results, and this is, again, meant just to be an overview, so some of the, a lot of the work is still in progress. Um, so we wanted to compare the backscatter data of the CL31, which is a low, low power system, to a higher power MPL LIDAR. Um, this is a February case, and this is a May case. This is a frontal overpass case, and uh, this is basically a fair weather case. You can see for, for both, both cases, the Salama does a really, really good job of capturing all of the main features um, even even up to 7.5 kilometers, which is equivalent to 25,000 feet, it does a pretty you know does a really good job of capturing this lowering of, of a cloud layer, um, um, and, and then it does a good job of capturing the evolution and development of the PBL and 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 uh, boundary layer clouds. And another thing I mentioned, the Salama actually does a better job than the MPL at the lower altitudes because it is its first band of complete overlap is much lower. All right, um, so now for, and I want to mention too, for, for this scenario, you can envision how the salometer can also be used to track air pollution and for now casting. Um, so I'm not going to dig, I'm not going to go into too much more detail about now casting, but from this you can kind of get the idea. 
Um, so this is for the PBL part. We use three detection methods for determining PBL. PBL. We use the Compton et al., the HITS et al., and the BL view algorithms. Um, this is some details about the Compton et al. algorithm. Um, basically, it's based off of the 1D hard wavelet method. This is details about the HITS et al. It's similar to the Compton et al., except it also uses an error function technique in combination. Um, and this is done to try to compensate for the difficulty with the dilation when you're using the, the wavelet technique. So instead of having to switch the dilation depending on conditions, we're, we're just um, using a, 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 the, the resolution of, of the, the backscatter profile and um, then tying it, you know, then verifying it with the uh, error, function, error function technique, which is basically a fitting of an idea profile, uh, which is shown here. So basically, um, the hard wavelet technique selects several possible PBL heights, and then we do several fittings of the error function technique, and then the one that fits the best is the PBL height. Um, and then the Visla BL view, which is its um, inherent software we're using also in the study. Um, we're only using it for the CL51 salometer at the uh, Billsfield site because it's a pretty expensive software package. You can only use it on a system at a time and you, you can't transfer it to another system, so we're just going to use it for the CL51 um, and, and see how, how it performs. Um, so here, uh, just a quick example of a good case um, for a PBL height comparison. This is, and the UMBC is basically the Compton et al. technique. So this is the UMBC um, results for this, for this thing, and this is the red, is the uh, hits et al. Um, the, the daytime is pretty much the same, but for, for the nighttime, the uh, hits et al. tries to capture the the stable boundary layer while the UMBC captures the residual layer. Um, this is a bad case where you have basically a cloud overlaying for most of the day. Um, so the, the PBL is pretty ill-defined. Um, and, and in this comparison, we also threw in the CL51 um, um, estimates. And, and again, and I forgot to mention, but it provides three estimates of potential PBL heights, with the three being the most likely, um, the one run through three. But, but, but there's, there's no real defined PBR height for this thing. Um, and then we uh, did overall statistics um, based off of radio sign data. Uh, we used these three techniques with the radio sign to determine um, PBR height. The, the Luliang, I believe that's how it's pronounced, uh, based off the gradient method. This is based off of the uh, turbulent definition. And the Hefner is more and more so of a lapse rate definition. I um, mean, you can kind of see overall how they perform, but we need, we've got to redo the analysis because we need to better quantify the uncertainty of the uh, reference methods. All right, so in, in summary, um, this ongoing study was to basically show um, that salometers can be used as a LIDAR system um, in the network and, and um, can be used to profile the atmosphere up to 25,000 feet, um, determine PBL heights, track plumes, and monitor atmospheric features such as waves, frontal passes, and et cetera. And um, that's it. We have plenty of time for questions. Yeah, I have a question. Could you say more about what the phases are for bringing this operational so the rest of the world can see this data? Um, well, currently, as I was saying, it's three phases. We're, we're going to we're going to um, first finish up the initial phase of showing, doing a demonstration of showing of how the salometer can perform to profile and work as a LIDAR. Second phase would just be expanding the network. The third phase would be actually sitting down. It doesn't seem like it's going to happen within, say, five years. I, don't, I wouldn't say it would happen within five years. Things may change. But at, at this point, I would say don't look for this data no earlier than 2020. But hopefully things would change. But at this point, that's the way it is. Yeah, the CL fifty. Well, the CL fifty one, um, and, and that's the one I kind of mentioned. Um, that's that's the latest, at least for Visla, That's the latest for the salometer. I'm sure Leosphere and some of the other companies have some salometers too. That's just as good. But, but what we have currently, when we were trans transitioning to a new so salometer, that's what won the contract, so that's what we have in our network. Okay, but the, that's 
Yeah. In, in the, yeah, ASOS have their own algorithms, yeah. Thank you.